Right. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Revy, and today we're going to be talking about an introduction to the process industry. Hope you all can hear me. Um, yeah, let's get started. Let's go right into the introductions. Um, give that a second to load. And yes, we run from the top. Penny, over to you. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Penny, and I am a project engineer at a uh, cool mill, and I'm also a member of the food and uh, drink committee. Uh, Pam. Hello. Hello. Thank you for that. Uh, Pamela Robinson, I'm um, a member of the Water and Wastewater um, TAC Committee. Uh, I am also a Principal Engineer in Atkins and I work in the water and wastewater sector. Thanks. Masood? Yes, good morning. Uh, this is Masood Bagarzadeh. I'm the Engineering Manager at uh, FLIR and also I'm a member of the uh, Process Industry uh, Board in IMAKE. <coughs> Yeah, uh, and as mentioned, I'm Renisad McGrelly, or Revy for short, but I have no uh, discernible titles after my name just yet. Um, Maurice? Yeah, Maurice, I'm a member of the Pharmaceuticals um, Technical Activity Committee and Vice Chair of the Northwest Process um, Division. Uh, I was previously a long term employee of a US pharmaceutical um, company. <clears throat> St. John? Good morning, John Bartlett. I am with Morris, the Vice Chair of the Northwest Centre. I've worked in uh, ICI, MOD, UKAA, mainly nuclear and then regulator for HSC of nuclear, again, chemical business. Thanks. Lovely. Thanks, John. Um, before I forget, folks, if you have a question through the presentation, um, Please use the I think it's ask a question box, uh, and it should come through to us, and we'll run through them at the end. Um, right, over to the next slide. So I'll start with some background um, to the process industry. So, yeah, the process industry concerns itself with the uh, yeah continuous production or batch production, where uh, each batch is is identical. So, for example, in the bottom right there, uh, it's orange juice, maybe drink, probably not a juice. Uh, it might have come through a continuous or batch process, but each uh, bottle of orange juice is the same. This would differ for something like uh, automotive, where you have almost discrete manufacturing. You have bills of materials, you have assembly of components, and uh, each car rolling off the shelf can be different, different paint, different uh, wheels, and what have you. Um, we cover many different business segments, including food, pharma, oil and gas, petrochem, uh, and water, so the representatives we have today and, and a little more as well. Um, so, scale of facilities, what do we deal with? It could be something small, something, well, small for us here, yeah, about 50 grand. Um, so that's, uh, that's perhaps a small pumping station as part of a wastewater treatment, or it could be 100 billion US dollars, and that would represent the entire investment uh, through the life of an oil field. Um, and again, I say entire investment, it's a lifetime investment, it's not one upfront thing, uh, it's the GDP of <laughs> several countries. So, yeah, there's an enormous uh, breadth and sense of scale. Um, Footprint-wise, uh, again, we can go small to big. So small, I would argue this little homebrew setup from Alpha Laval constitutes a process plant, if you will. You have process piping, you have process equipment, you've got pumps, heat exchangers, perhaps a cyclone. You'll have utility connections to your mains of water, to uh, drainage, if you will, electricity. Um, so it can be that size. So on the right, uh, that's Das Island. That is an island in the Persian Gulf, man-made island, uh, dedicated to the production of oil and gas. It is enormous. Yeah, if you see that flat strip uh, diagonally on the right there, that's a runway for the planes. And those large tanks could easily be 100 meters in diameter. So again, when we talk footprint, we go small to big as well. Um, and yeah, I'll now pass to Penny, uh, who will speak a little bit about food and drink industry. Hello, hopefully you can hear me. 
And yeah, so let's go on to the next slide. Yeah, there we go. So food and drink unites the world and powers us forward. Our bodies simply need it to stay alive. On average, we eat three meals a day and we drink between six to eight cups of fluid a day. In the UK, we eat food and drink that is grown or produced in countries all over the world and it travels miles before it reaches your plate. But have you ever stopped to actually think about how these products magically appear ready to be cooked or eaten in our supermarkets? So the food and drink processing sector transforms raw agriculture commodities or semi-processed food products into a broad range of semi-prepared or consumer-ready food and beverage products. So on this slide here, you can see a woman on the left picking paddy, um, which as you can see on the right, once processed is what we all know and love and recognize to be rice. It's this process that Cool Milk, the company where I work, specializes in. So at Cool Milk, we effectively sand rice. We have created a, a modern, ultra low power, simplified and sustainable approach to cereal milling. The machine on the right is the cool mill machine. Um, and as you can see here, there are three different ways that rice um, can be and still is processed today all around the world. So on the left, you can see hand pounding um, which still happens in places uh, in Africa and particularly in Malawi. Um, and it's so women can spend six hours a day hand pounding rice. So they're essentially smashing the, the paddy, uh, the husk into uh, white rice, which is what we eat. Then in the middle, you have mechanized milling, um, which was introduced in the 1860s. But this way of milling is uh, they use a lot of heat and it's really it's it's very mechanical heavy, let's say, and it can uh, result in losses of up to 80 percent in the entire production. So you're you're losing and you're damaging a lot of the rice along the way. Um, and then cool mill after 8000 years is the, the third generation of this technology. We we really are bringing about something completely different and changing the game. Uh, we work. Uh, with cold milling um, and we can, our machine can also run off grid because it is so low powered. Um, so yeah, we're basically looking at trying to really maximize the, the return of food and to avoid wasted rice and power. Um, we also are carrying out some research uh, so that we can utilize the whole rice plant, which is something that I've been working on the past year that I joined the company. And we're looking at so you get bran, um, which is a byproduct from processing rice, and this can be converted into nutritious human food ingredient. And also we can use the husk um, to be burnt for power as well. So in my day to day as a project engineer, I do a range of activities and um, I'd go from testing and carrying out milling trials which involves the joyous task of counting rice by hand, <laughs> which I've learned, and then also to organizing the team and managing finances, for example. So it just gives you a bit of an idea of what a project engineer does in the food and drink industry. Um, now, I chose to enter this industry because I really recognize the, the positive impact and potentially life-changing effects technology can have on people. And to be honest, I really never knew much about the, the food and drinks processing sector before joining. Um, but from working in places like India and China uh, during university, I observed how different cultures and countries processes sell and eat food, like how much of an impact they can have on someone's life. Uh, in the UK, we are so fortunate. We either import food and drink that's already been processed and packaged in country, or we use our own advanced food and drink processing systems based here in the UK. So, for example, in Scotland, we have the fastest bottling line in Europe based at Highland Spring in Blackford, which some of you may know bottles spring water to sell around the globe. The Highland Spring line makes and fills 73,600 bottles of water every hour. So just to give you an idea of the scale. Okay, so, sorry. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Um, 
so hopefully from uh, that video, and I'm just going to talk over this video as it plays right now, you can really uh, see the vast array of different engineering technologies which are used in the food and drink processing sector. So even for the simpling actions such as uh, rinsing these beer cans out before filling, you've got to ensure there's no dust inside. Um, and then also, for example, laying the, the lids on top of the can requires these, these processes which seem so simple to us require complex mechanical engineering um, design and uh, yeah. So one thing to which really fascinated me was when you're designing or improving processes on the scale, you have to take into consideration lots of different things which I maybe didn't think about through university was, for example, quality management. So ensuring that each beer tastes the same and it's got the exact same amount of liquid inside that's advertised on the can. Then you've got health and safety. So ensuring anyone operating the machines isn't injured. Cost reduction, um, for example, if you reduce the amount of aluminium needed for each can, even just by a micro millimeter, that could save the company millions at, uh, in return. And then in, in time is another one. So time, is money in the processing industry. If you can reduce the time it takes for the beer can to go from the start of the, of the line to the end, it means you can produce and package more beer cans between the working hours of the factory. Um, yeah, so if you, like this, oh here, that's quite a cool video of the, the lids just going on, which I was explaining earlier. Um, and then finally, because uh, that video is too long to, to play fully, but finally um, there, exists a huge opportunity in the food and drinks processing sector, which is one of the reasons I, I got into it. Um, the question we should really all be asking ourselves uh, as the innovators of tomorrow is how can we make globally secure food systems that are sustainable and help reduce, uh, and help reduce poverty? So during the past year, COVID-19 and Brexit have revealed how vulnerable our food systems are. Relying on imported food exposes a country to limited supply or, for example, how we're experiencing it today in the UK, we have no petrol for our cars. Um, we also have a growing population and climate change to think about. So let's just take rice uh, industry, for example. Currently, um, the rice feeds 3.5 billion people daily, but by 2050, this will be 6 billion and production will have to increase by 70% to meet demand. And then on the climate change front, rice is also a major polluter. It's responsible for around 2.5% of all greenhouse gas emissions and the rice's climate footprint is comparable to that of international aviation. So therefore, it really it opened my eyes and it made me realise that we've got to make better use and process um, better what is already growing. Growing more rice is no longer a viable option. So these problems of climate change, a growing population and insecure food systems are applicable to more than just the rice industry. They're applicable across the whole of the food and uh, drinks processing industry. So here really exists an opportunity for any of you guys listening uh, to, to solve. And um, yeah, thank you for listening. Thanks for that, Penny. Um, yeah, over to you, Masood. Uh, thank you, Ravi. Can you hear me? Yeah, all good, all clear. All right, thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I will be speaking about oil and gas and uh, chemicals uh, industry, or as I prefer to, to call them, energy and chemicals industry. Uh, the energy and chemicals industries are uh, covering broad range of process industries, uh, which uh, traditionally uh, included uh, uh, mainly oil and gas, uh, but uh, uh, but it also includes uh, likes of LNG, hydrogen, uh, carbon capture, and also uh, very important is the chemicals uh, we we produce. So the photos you see under the screen, they may look uh, very similar, but in reality they are a different type of plants which producing different type of uh, fuel or chemicals for us. So historically, uh, oil and gas projects have been dominant in the energy industry. 
Uh, but uh, there's always new and emerging uh, technologies, uh, uh, which recently are like LNG, hydrogen, carbon capture. They're all gathering momentum and uh, they will all support reducing the greenhouse uh, emissions as well as serving our energy needs. Uh, <clears throat> on top of that, chemicals uh, from, uh, form a significant portion of the industry and provide us with the material that can help advance our other technologies. So the, uh, the, produ the products from uh, chemicals are used everywhere from uh, packaging, so food, to mobile phones, computers, and also even in the spacecraft because uh, they come in very different uh, shape and form and uh, strength. So there's, a, there's always an, a huge potential for mechanical engineering uh, in these industries. Uh, <clears throat> you can be a, a design engineer designing a, any of those equipment you see in the, on the screen, uh, or it could be laying out the plant, uh, could be uh, a, all, all, all sort of uh, design activities or it could be uh, uh, engine management and project management, and also construction. Ultimately, we have to build these plants. Uh, energy industry in the overall has always been a very diverse and international um, industry, and we are all always part of a multi-disciplined, multi-national, multi-location team. Uh, we always have teams different uh, in different locations. Uh, we are working with them, and also as I said, and what my colleagues have is it's very international uh, uh, business. So, <clears throat> if you want to be part of the movement for greener future, and uh, for uh, and also in chemical industry, this is the industry to work for. So if you want to know about the products that come out of these uh, plants, so let's move to the next slide. So the, the products typical, it comes in three different uh, uh, forms. Uh, they might be uh, liquids, uh, so like petrol or diesel we use for cars. It could be gas, uh, which is again could be the gas to our homes, or also uh, a gas that feeds uh, chemical plants or being hydrogen, being a gas, but also comes in a uh, shape of uh, solids, uh, mainly chemicals, uh, in particular polymers come in uh, solids, although some of the, the chemicals are in uh, in the shape of uh, a gas or uh, liquid as well. Uh, some of the uh, products you may be very familiar with, as I said, like petrol, gas in particular, but when it comes to chemicals, they may not be very familiar because they typically serve other businesses, not directly to the customers and users, uh, which uh, then the, the businesses make the products that then you will be familiar with. Um, examples of those chemicals are like polyethylene, poly, uh, propylene, styrene, uh, polyvinyl chlorides, ABS, uh, and all, all different uh, type of uh, uh, chemicals and plastics and uh, high strength material, which I, as I said, that we can use them all in all different uh, uh, industries. With that, I hand over to Pamela to talk about water and waste industry. Thank you, just unmuting myself there. Uh, yes, I'm uh, Pamela Robinson. I gave a brief introduction at the start, um, and I work for Atkins as principal mechanical engineer in the water and wastewater sector predominantly. On to the next slide. Just this just gives you two typical um, examples of the clean and wastewater um, processes that you could you could possibly find. Um, it's not at every site. It, every site is slightly unique, slightly different. The clean water example uh, at the bottom, this is taken from a, a reservoir or a river abstraction, generally pumping stations to some settlement, some filtration, um, generally dis always disinfectant, disinfection process on the water side, uh, which is generally chlorine. Um, on this one, you then got um, a huge tank held up in the air, which, which provides the pressure to deliver clean and wholesome water to your tap whether that be in the industry or uh, at your homes. 
but there could be more pumping stations along the way to make sure that if you're at the end of the clean water network, you still get a suitable amount of um, pressure at your tap rather than just a dribble. Um, this is just a typical example. If you were taking water from a aquifer, you could just have a borehole pump and disinfection, and it's wholesome enough to be able to deliver straight to your taps at that point, and there isn't the need for any extra processing. It is, this is why water tastes very regional, because of where the source has come from and what need, what's needed to be done to it to make it wholesome, um, so it doesn't make us ill. Obviously, water and wastewater is used in the UK and all over the world. So this could take you all over the world, this um, particular industry, if you want it to. Over on the right is just a, another typical example. It's not every wastewater treatment works. It's very unique for every wastewater treatment works. All depends on what foul flow is coming into the works and how it's to be processed. This particular example uses preliminary uh, treatment of screenings uh, and some grit removal. It then goes on to a primary settlement stage where the sludge is drawn off, the effluent wears over, you then have some uh, secondary treatment where the bugs are there to, to eat the, the nasty nastiness out of the out of the effluent. Then it's gone on to some further secondary settlement where some further sludges are drawn off and the effluent wears over and then there's a final polishing stage in this particular example uh, of some extra filtration before it's then deemed safe enough to go into the local water course. The effluent that's discharged um, is monitored to make sure it, it's to the right quality and the right quantity. We're not sending too much and we're not sending too little. Um, the quality will depend on the water course that it's being discharged to. Um, again, it, 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 every discharge is different. The sludges on the wastewater treatment works, that's where it gets a little bit more interesting. As the sludges I mentioned earlier are drawn off the process, the sludges can be used to create energy. So this is a, a very good energy from waste example, quite raw. Um, the, the, the sludges are drawn off, they're heated up, the gas is, uh, methane is drawn off. The gas could be cleaned up and put straight back into our gas network powering our homes, powering our industries, powering the site it came from. Or the gas uh, could be used to drive engines and then the electricity that's generated could again be pumped, could be uh, put it back into our network to power our homes, power our um, industries and power the site that it came from in the first place. So it's, it's very exciting that we're using our waste streams um, to create energy to try and reduce our carbon footprint, to try and be better for the environment, to be more sustainable. Um, our sites are a working asset, uh, a very le uh, real asset uh, that you see up and down the country and all around the world. Uh, these assets um, have to be maintained, they have to be optimized, they have to be um, the effluent, the discharge could could change we could have more houses built so they always need to be modified you may need to put extra assets inside that existing site to try and make the life suitable for the discharge uh, to deliver more clean water to homes we and then finally when the asset leaks, reaches the end of its life it needs to be decommissioned we need engineers all across these stages um, and we need you we need we definitely need more engineers um, and I find that the, the water and um, wastewater sector is quite an interesting uh, topic to be part of, especially when we're talking from talking about energy from waste. Um, I think on to the next slide, if I get the right mouse. So this is just two, two examples um, that are actually happening at the moment. Uh, the both wastewater treatment works. Um, I'm sorry, I find wastewater slightly more interesting than clean water, but both have their, have their place. On the left-hand side, uh, this is a new site that's in construction at the moment. Um, it's still being tested and commissioned. Uh, this is just uh, partway through construction. I think the, um, it's being tested for water tightness um, when the picture was taken, and it's just being filled at the moment. It's not quite to its full capacity. And basically, it's a brand new wastewater treatment works. The existing wastewater treatment works, unfortunately, is 
due to coastal erosion is disappearing faster than anticipated. So this new wastewater treatment works has been um, is a, is a mile further in line and is outside of the coastal erosion 100 year plan. The flow comes in, um, so the, this is the left hand picture, sorry. The flow comes in on the bottom right hand corner, it's pumped in. So there's an upgrade to the existing pumping station that feeds this works to get it to the new site. It then goes around in a loop um, on top of that, those lagoons, there'll be some aerofac units they're called, which are basically wind powered aeration systems, uh, paddles in below the water surface that keep the bugs alive, keep everything momentum, keep the um, wastewater flowing through the system. Um, there'll also be aeration uh, supplemented with diffusers, so there'll be some low energy um, blowers mounted at surface level between the two lagoons. It's then piped through to the second lagoon on the left, gone through uh, so with some more biological treatment with the, with the form of the diffusers and the um, aerovac units with the paddle aerator systems as I mentioned earlier and it uh, leaves the site from the bottom left hand side uh, where there's some uh, screens and it's then either pumped or gravity fed to the long sea outfall um, depending on whether the sea is in or out as to whether the pumps are required or not. This is a very low carbon solution. It's also massive. So we have to have the land available, available to be able to deliver this kind of system. This will be the largest in the UK once it's up and running as well. There are some in the Anglian area and some in Scottish water at the moment, I believe. And this picture is taken from the Yorkshire area. Uh, so that, that'll be brilliant. It'll be, it'll be closely monitored as well as to how well it's doing, how the effluent quality is. Uh, come the back end. Uh, there is scope in there to add in a UV unit um, if the effluent quality doesn't quite meet um, the standards set by the DEA. But hopefully it will do and it will be fine. It's a very low carbon solution as it, as it stands. Uh, the site, the picture on the right um, is just a computer image at the moment. It's going through design. Um, it's a wetland system basically to try and this AMP period, the wastewater and water sector work in five year work periods. And this five year work period, um, a lot of phosphorus, a lot of emphasis is placed on removal of phosphorus within our wastewater treatment works on the final effluent. And this is using a very traditional, I suppose, going back to what we possibly saw earlier, many hundreds of years ago, is wetland systems. So the buildings on the, the left, you can just see, uh, contain some upfront screening, and then it cascades through the wetland system. Um, this is the size of, I think, three Olympic swimming pools, yes. Um, and they're hoping with this system, it will move the phosphorus as per the, the discharge consent. It will boost local wildfire, wildlife. It's a natural way to remove phosphorus. It's sustainable and it's certainly a low carbon solution. But again, a lot of land is required to deliver this. Um, in many sites, we've already got the existing wastewater treatment works and we're trying to make that those assets work harder. Uh, so we may put in existing uh, additional assets between existing assets to try and polish the effluent to, to remove that extra phosphorus. Um, and we may not have the same land um, availability we have with these two sites, but I just wanted to show you two uh, low carbon solutions that are actually ongoing this AMP um, and very real. And just to just to stress again, um, we need engineers to help design, to help construct, to help optimize, to help decommission. We need engineers throughout, throughout the whole of this process to help make our world go around to help deliver wholesome water and to treat our final effluent. Thank you. I shall now hand over to Maurice, uh, who will discuss pharmaceutical. Thank you. Right, thanks, Pamela. I, I'm going to talk about the role of um, mechanical engineers in the pharmaceutical industries. And the question is, you're a mechanical engineer. Why would you want to come into the pharmaceutical industry? Well. The pharmaceutical industry is dedicated to improve people's lives, quality of life. It's got high standards and values. Um, 
to make pharmaceutical companies develop and make drugs that are dispensed into liquids, tablets, capsules, vials, syringes, and inhalers. All this is carried out in clean rooms using high clean utilities and high quality machines that need high quality engineers to specify and maintain and look after them. You can't now make pharmaceutical products without engineers. And the pharmaceutical companies develop the contribution to engineers to make the products. Scientists start the process, but the engineers finish it. Now, to give you some idea of the scale, a cost of a new drug development from concept to approval, FDA, MHRA approval, is 1.3 billion US dollars. That's one drug. And it may take 10 years, not, not in the case of COVID, for instance. A new pharmaceutical facility costs between 10 million and 550 million US dollars. Pharmaceuticals are highly regulated industry. Uh, the, the concept is you cannot test, quality test pharmaceuticals as as you can an engineer, and you can't take something off the line and test it. Quality has to be built in. In other words, it's, when it's finished, it's right, first time, all the time. That's the product strength, the identity, the effectiveness, labeling, repeatability, thousands or millions of doses. There's no room for error. And this calls for highly disciplined engineers. And uh, the engineers are used to working to tight specifications that control you using approved drawings, etc., etc. The facilities have to be well designed, so the operations carried out using control temperature and humidity conditions in clean rooms. They, they, they also the, the rooms have to be designed so the operators are comfortable and they don't, they don't make uh, mistakes. You know, they've got plenty of room to move around and uh, they know where to go and start things. Um, there's a picture of, a, I think it's a sort of a, a mini fermenter there. And that's uh, an agitator. As you can see, a lot of stainless steel used. Just go back. Go to the engineering practice. The engineering pr procedures have to be written down precisely so they, they satisfy the regulators. And they, all these procedures have a direct impact on quality. And the sort of um, practice, GEP, good engineering practice, and technical activity, specification, design, construction, operation, maintenance, and repair of facilities and equipment, covering project management, qualification, commissioning, validation, calibration, and testing, and uh, documentation and record keeping, staff education, and contamination and environmental control. And I'll give an example of that. If um, if the FDA, Federal Drug Administration Inspector, comes in, he would want to know um, part, say, the sales start in a bulk, say, a bulk position. He wants to know about the ticket that shows how much is going to be added. Then he would not want to know about the machine that's um, Weigh, you know, weighing or weighing the, the the product. Then he wants to know the calibration certificate for the machine. Then he wants to see the record, the, the training of the person who, who's calibrated the machine. In other words, it goes on and on and on. So no room for error. Now, the, the kind of um, jobs for mechanical engineers and the pharmaceutical industry, plant and equipment design, that includes that includes all the um, design specification of all, all the machinery, uh, the, all the reactors, the vessels, um, centrifuges, uh, etc. Then there's the plant operation maintenance reliability, that's ensuring that the, 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 that the plant is working correctly and it's maintained, it's reliable. Plant integrity insurance, 
that it's const it's constructed properly and um everything um everything is correct let's say by it's sort of inspection really i'm talking about construction management that's the new facilities plan commissioning startup that's new facilities validation activities that that's proving the design the installation and operation is correct there, there there's a sort of written rule or, or unwritten rule if it's not written down it hasn't happened so if someone comes in and said we've done this okay you sign a form say you've done it and what 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 what, what, what you actually did and what tolerances you work to and the last one is energy use and saving. There's a lot of energy used in making pharmaceuticals because of the air flows and um, the opportunities for heat recovery, um, a lot of air conditioning systems. Now, operating companies generally employ in their staff and outsource new plant and equipment modifications to engineering contractors. And the mechanical engineers employed by operating companies involved in plant maintenance and management and supervision of contractors and, and, and for maintenance and the supervision of contracts of design and construction and obviously there are opportunities with contractors some very large um, engineering contractors to build pharmaceutical plants so the roles are design engineers which are covered I talked about the facility, building services and utilities engineers. A lot of utilities, steam, water, um, air, etc. Project engineers, project managers, mechanical asset and reliability engineers. That's a sort of inspection. And I'll, I'll explain the particular work undertaken at a later date in a later presentation. The pharmaceutical industry has many successful and renowned international companies producing a wide variety of all care products. The larger companies, uh, which you, you know about, you know, GSK and Pfizer and all those, they are at the forefront with new products. When the product goes out of patents, there are companies that, that make make the tablets or, or you know, or the particular drug out out of patent because. When some when people are on a product, they they probably are on it for the rest of their lives. So it's it's vital that the, the, the continuity is stayed. You know, when the products are available, um, an obvious thing. But pharmaceutical companies benefit any anyone in the world who requires treatment from these products. So if it works on me, it'll work on someone in Africa, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, finally. Working in the pharmaceutical industry has given me the opportunity to make many new people travel and gain new experience of skills. I've, I've gained a lot of experience of equipment, of building services. Uh, I've done a lot of traveling in the United States. So I, I, I'd recommend it. Um, um, it's, it's a good industry to be in. And uh, it's, um, it's an ongoing, it's, it's not going to disappear, let's say. So I'm going to hand over to John now. John? Uh, I might take the reins back there, Maurice. Pat, thanks a lot. Um, Pun. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I'll, I'll... I beg your pardon. Yeah. I'm out to turn. So, I'll speak now about some key design documents. You know, our, our experts from the industries have shown you how each industry may may have different facilities they design. Ultimately, we are facility designers, but one thing we do have in common are the design documents we see. So first, I'll very briefly uh, talk about the process flow diagram. This is a PFD. Um, what we see here is the principal uh, process piping uh, denoted by the lines and arrows and um, the major equipment and how they're connected. Uh, and you can see eventually what service they serve. One, this example appears to come uh, it is crude oil coming in the top right. We have crude furnace um, export. And yeah, it's, uh, it just shows the major items, major recirculation systems as well. Uh, and that would differ from this next slide here, uh, which is the PMID. So this is the piping and instrumentation diagram. 
This is similar in several regards. We still have major process piping. We still have major process equipment. But there is a greater emphasis on instrumentation and control here. So I've highlighted an example at the top right. If you see, we have a vessel uh, called an accumulator there. And there is uh, the line shows a process pipe, uh, pipe sorry, eventually going uh, to the flare. There's a valve downstream of that vessel, and it appears to be connected by a, what's a PC there, a probably pressure control. Now, it's not my diagram here, but it's likely that uh, on the accumulation of a certain amount of pressure, uh, gas pressure at the top of that vessel, that instrument will tell that valve through the dotted line to open, which would then relieve that glass, uh, gas to flare. So that's what we see in the PNID. If you look below as well, we see an LCV. I've highlighted that in red, and that could be level control valve. So that valve would open or close or have some prearranged setting based on the level of liquid in that vessel. Um, but yeah, all of us on this call should be familiar with that. This is something that we'd be um, uh, seeing day in and day out uh, in our jobs in the process industry. Next, what I have is I'll try and be a bit quick. Feel free to ask questions in the box if you feel uh, I'm going to rush through this next bit. Um, but I've got an example here of what we do in practice. Uh, it's not necessarily chronological, but it does help to explain the situation in this format. Um, so we start, let's say, with a site. We have this. We've got steel structures and floors and uh, some nice birds in the back. Um, our next addition is the basic process plan. So now we've added uh, a motor in blue connected and coupled to a pump, uh, likely a progressive cavity type, and piping to a vessel on the left and what appears to be a shell and tube heat exchanger on the right. This is the basic process plan. But to get there, we have to do a lot as mechanical engineers. Uh, as Masood had mentioned earlier, we are heavily involved with our piping team who are mechanical engineers with the 3D model and layout. So the distribution of equipment and piping and so forth is done by mechanical engineers. On the left, 3D model, you can see it's very, very complicated. And on the right is a plot plan. Uh, it's a primitive arrangement of where the equipment will go on the site. That is the responsibility of the uh, mech engineer. As well as that, we'll also be reviewing vendor documentation. So uh, it is not often that we will do the detailed design of each equipment. We will do the design of the facility. So we'll have, in this case, that pump vendor before. He will give us the information which will allow us to integrate that pump successfully with the rest of the facility. Some of the information we may pass on to other disciplines are, let's say, the piping nozzle loads, the allowable loads on each, um, each nozzle that's there at the top. On the right, we have connection details, so we know how big the nozzles are, uh, where to connect them to, and what pressure rating they are. At the bottom, we have weights, so this would go to our civils department to ensure they can uh, design the foundation correctly. And on the left, I've shown a quick foundation layout drawing, uh, but it's for the anchor bolts, so we know it can be positioned correctly at site. Uh, I'll go next now and show you the value added by mechanical engineers. So for the motor, uh, we have discussed with our electrical counterparts what the electrical loads will be. Um, foundation loads will be given to civil so they can adequately design the floor. Anchor bolt locations, likewise, so we can position it. And nozzle loads and sizes we've given to piping to make sure we don't bust the pipe. Um, next, we duplicate the rotating machinery. Now, I won't go into too much detail here, uh, but in essence, rotating machinery is, is not as reliable as its static counterparts. So process critical uh, pumps and whatnot are often spared, uh, which means you have one running, one standby. In event of failure, you can switch it over without shutting the entire process line down. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there for now. Then uh, we move on to add the instruments and process control. And as you can see now, um, it's busy, right? We've got a lot more going on. Um, we've got a lot of yellow piping process control depressurization systems. We've got some valves in there now as well, so we're not just running full throttle. We can control the system. And green appears to be the instrumentation here. Um, so if I give you an example, if you look back to the P&ID we mentioned earlier, we had at the top there the pressure control on a valve and at the bottom level control on a valve. Uh, if we go back to this image, it's, I can't say for sure what it is, but it's possible that that valve on the right, because I see a green instrument line come into it, that it will have some sort of uh, control based off an instrument elsewhere on the plant. Um, so the valves are shown there in yellow, the instrumentation shown in green, and it is possible, for example, that the level in that tank, uh, in the vessel, sorry, 
uh, will instruct that valve to perform a certain function. And that's how the PNID will result in a material change in reality. Uh, yeah, so next we're on to fire protection and mechanical handling equipment. So uh, the essential fire safety features are here. We've got a cabinet, some sprinklers, and integrated piping. But as a mechanical engineer, something else you'll be involved with is the mechanical handling. Every uh, every item, valves, piping included, that requires maintenance, be it routine or during operation or anything at all, will require access and ergonomic access at that. So here we've got some ladders on the right. Uh, we've got an unusual scaffold arrangement on the left. Uh, and as you can see, it's likely poor ergonomic access. It's going to be a tough crouch job to get to some of those valves. Um, the cranes are in there. Often this equipment is far too heavy to lift by hand. And if it's tucked away in a corner, you'll need to make sure that you can have um, uh, the correct mechanical handling equipment, in this case a crane, to ensure you can access the uh, yeah, the items that need removing. It could be the tube bundle in the exchanger, it could be the motor, it could be the pump. Um, but yeah, ergonomic and safe access to equipment that requires maintenance, that's within mechanical handling scope as well. So a quick before and after, just to show you, uh, yeah, the level of detail and value added. Um, now, I'll, again, I'll, in the spirit of time, I'll, I'll make this brief, but uh, my time, I've been here what, four years in the process industry, and I have uh, amassed, I think, uh, sufficient experience to go ahead and now apply for, for the CNG. The, the process industry will cater to um, chartership applications. I've definitely felt that I've got the experience required. And for example, so if we take A, when I assess the suitability of perhaps different technologies for a duty, that could uh, quite rightly come under A. Reviewing those vendor documents I showed you earlier, that, that general arrangement drawing and specifying equipment as well, what fits the duty, that would come under B. Managing your vendors, this is something uh, we do a lot in the mechanical industry. Uh, sorry, in the process industry as mechanical engineers. But yeah, vendor management would come under C. Um, D is hit a lot. We have a considerable amount of discussions with our other disciplines. As I mentioned, it could be electrical, control systems, instrumentation, piping, civils. Um, but yeah, a lot of communication. And on an engineering level as well, uh, that's gone on. And lastly, yeah, to professional codes and standards or industry codes and standards as well, we have to meet um, and legislative requirements too. Addressing those will uh, meet the e-competency. So yeah, all in all, it's a, a safe bet. And lastly, just wanted to touch before I open it up to questions. Um, talk about the future of the process industry. Uh, you may have heard the buzzwords for Industry 4.0 going around intelligently. Uh, sorry, essentially making um, a lot of process control and instrumentation without much human interaction. Uh, so the instruments we saw earlier, essentially getting smarter, probably smarter than me at this rate. And then the energy transition. Um, so as, again, Masood touched on, we have uh, diversifying work coming in. We're seeing... We're seeing production of battery technologies, uh, so new batteries for electrical vehicles. We're seeing carbon capture come through and likely come in more and more. Uh, and hydrogen, of course, for the, uh, for the buzz that it has, there's a significant amount of infrastructure investment required. So these are the kind of projects we see coming in in the future. Um, and yeah, I'll open it up to, to questions now. Thanks a lot for, for listening. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. I've received two questions so far. Uh, one is from Zakaria Abdi, who asks, uh, is this recorded and will it be available? The, the answers are yes, it is being recorded. And yes, it will be available, I believe, through YouTube, as was the last one. The second question is from Gaurav Nanajka. And he asks, uh, whoops, let me do that properly. Uh, he noticed the heat required in making, for example, popper is 170 degrees C. This heat is coming from natural gas stroke fossil fuel, or is it coming from the decarbonized process? I think the person to answer that might best be Penny Morton. Penny, for you. Hello. 
Um, in, in all honesty, I don't specialise in the poppadom process, so I have no idea. Um, but something to, to bear in mind is, um, as uh, some of the other speakers were speaking about before, was these processes which exist right now, um, the there's a lot of ways that we can improve them in terms of uh, for reducing emissions and carbon but that is that is an area for innovation and it's an area that the current industries are now trying to to work towards is changing the changing the way that these uh, machines or processes are powered to be a lot more sustainable um, but there's there's a lot of teething issues uh, to do that. It's it's not like we can just change plug in and play a different system. Uh, there's a lot more mechanical engineering that needs to go on behind the process to make sure it's all safe, to make sure it's still going to run the same way. Um, and that is where their innovation is working on today. So yeah, honest answer is I generally don't know because I don't uh, specialise in pop doms. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you anyway. Uh, <laughs> anybody else on the panel ha have an answer to uh, Gaurav's question? I suppose I don't have a direct answer, but just to um, expand on Penny's point, the waste stream in one industry uh, could be required in another industry, and there are innovative um, ideas going on uh, I, um, and solutions going on where we can use use that waste heat elsewhere we need heat as well in the digestion process for for waste uh, that waste heat is then used uh, to heat water elsewhere on the site you know we're always thinking all of us are as our industry where can that waste be used elsewhere so it isn't truly a waste and it can be to try and reduce our carbon uh, there's no point having waste heat in one side and then heating water on another side of the plant uh, you know, we are trying to to make everything stick together and make make everything more sustainable and less carbon hungry. Um, so just to add on to Penny's point. Thank you, Pamela. I point out that the reason that an industry might regard uh, a, a stream as waste, energy or otherwise, or useful depends upon the design balance that is specified to start with. Uh, a long, long time ago, heat and energy were quite cheap, coming from coal or whatever, so you didn't bother, you just ditched the stuff to the atmosphere. Nowadays, the balance is partly cost, but partly environmental, and you will look, as uh, Pamela has said, at using what would otherwise be regarded as waste. Uh, I have another question. Uh, this is from, well, it's not a question, sorry, this is Gordon Sharp of CPW. He's saying that it's a very interesting presentation and it was good to see a lot of potential crossover from mechanical building services, particularly on the fluor uh, presentation. Uh, a question here from Jagdadeed Rao Balia uh, from Shell. What is mechanical engineers equipment design future in the hydrogen sector? I do not uh, know who to pass that over to, apart from possibly Masood, please. Yes, John, I think I can answer that. Okay. So uh, hydrogen, uh, despite what we think, is not, it's not, uh, it's nothing new. So we always knew about hydrogen and, uh, uh, and its use. In fact, uh, for hundreds of years, not hundreds of years, for, for the past 50, 60 years at least, We've been using hydrogen in the refineries to enrich uh, uh, the diesel and petrol and to take the sulfur out. So uh, hydrogen on its own is not unknown. Uh, it needs some uh, specific design requirements because of the nature of the hydrogen, the small molecule size and uh, the potential uh, metallurgical issues that may cause. Otherwise, everything is, is known and we're using it. What will the, the, the hydrogen expanding now in different uh, uh, sections being different uh, colors, we, we quote them now, blue, green, uh, and they come from different sources. Ultimately, you know, the, the, uh, the mechanical designs is very similar to what we had. 
but we are moving into high efficiency designs which will impact all industries including hydrogen i hope that uh, that answers the question <laughs> thank you anybody else on the panel okay another question from tosin adedipe from cranfield university uh, can we find out a little more about industry 4.0 in relation to uh, process system project management. I've got to say the best source will be the IMECI headquarters website and follow the links from there. Uh, you could, oh sorry, I could ask. Masood, do you have anything on Industry 4.0 off the top of your head? Uh, yes, so again, uh, the key one on, uh, on the, uh, no, it's the same, same as any other industry, uh, we are moving to uh, like a data-centric uh, and processing data uh, industry, which uh, basically with the industry 4.0, if you have enough data about the operation of, let's say, a piece of equipment or, or a plant or part of a plant, you can better run the... Uh, the plant and equipment and also you can predict the uh the maintenance requirements which then it makes uh the, the process more efficient and uh, instead of waiting for something to break you can repair it in time and extend life of the uh the facility so uh, and and th this is coming in uh in use everywhere and with the increased use of let's say 5g Again, the, the, the communication between the different instruments and sensors you have and the data you can collect and process, it's all of that Thank will you. move. Uh, I've got a meeting at one. I'll have something uh, in 10 minutes. So that, that, that's where yeah. we, will, we will see more use well, of well, that well, industry. Yeah, salad, salad and whatever. Oh, do you want a salmon sandwich? Salmon, yeah. Salmon. Hello? <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Basud. Um, could I just expand on that point? Um, <laughs> so actually at Toolmill, um, we have been working a lot on our IoT systems mm -hmm. and we actually just finished a six month project using augmented reality and HoloLens. So during COVID, we obviously couldn't get out to our machines. So we were using the Microsoft HoloLens to um, set up guides and essentially uh, augmented reality instructions that we can then use out in the field. And this is going to reduce our costs massively so that we're not having to travel out every time to, to fix a machine. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, we, we're starting to use, um, we've got a, our own dashboard. So essentially our machine out in India, if we want to change the speed, change the uh, change the bell or we can I can control that from my laptop here in Scotland um, and we we're working very much on, on the side of um, yeah IOT and and there's a lot of other things to, to think about when working internationally uh, with data for example in China there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of wall <laughs> firewalls to be able to get through and it's it, 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 you've got to also think about who whose data is this who is responsible for it and there's a lot there's a lot of interesting new prob problems potentially opportunities arising from industry 4.0 as well um, but there's a lot of great things that can come that can come with it as well if if we can train up our engineers on the ground remotely it means that experts in the field we don't need as many of them we can just have them communicate through technology on the ground and fix it in seconds compared to to waiting for a flight over which again is bad for the planet and um, so yeah that's just something that cool mill are working on as well thanks penny i point out that uh, my reference before to design balance the balance nowadays is very much towards the fact that you have available an enormous amount of data, materials, personnel, and so on, stress analysis and all the rest of it. To go to Penny's point in her presentation about beer can filling and saving the micromillimeter, you will have that data available and you can make those decisions. 
uh, and it, it relies largely on the in, uh, sorry the Internet of Things and communications connections, which are pretty readily available, in fact, obviously through uh, Russia and China. So, do we have any more questions, please? Then, in that case, I can pass you back to. Uh, Masood, I believe. I think that will be ready to to close the call. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah please Thanks, do. Guys. Um, yeah, I think we'll we'll close that out. All your questions seem to be answered. Uh, we're slightly over, but thanks a lot for participating. Um, and yeah, hopefully we'll have future webinars in similar fashion, and uh, you can join those as well. Thanks a lot for coming by. Thank you all.